Hello everyone! Today I'm going to reattempt a mission that I tried back in 2016. Back in September of 2016, I built an ion engined plane that was capable of level flight and could even climb to about 19 kilometers. This is still my most viewed video, so I've always wanted to do a follow up to this. In 2017, Stratzen Blitz found a kind of parallel approach where he used giant electric props to get up to a high altitude and then use a giant electric slingshot to fling an ion plane into suborbital trajectory. This is one of my favorite KSP videos ever. You should definitely check it out and I'll put a link in the description. One very intriguing part of this video was that he claimed that ion engines alone don't have enough thrust to reach orbit. He did wisely stipulate in KSP version 1.3, but there hasn't been any relevant changes since then. Irritatingly, this is a true statement. However, with a dash of trickery, we can turn it into a false statement. To make this a false statement, I'm going to get from the surface of Kerbin to low Kerbin orbit using absolutely only ion engines. My original ion plane wasn't capable of getting anywhere near orbit because it was drag limited to a fairly slow speed. To think about this drag, I'm going to categorize it into two parts. There's the good drag, which is the drag from wings. This drag is good because a high ratio of this drag is experienced in lift, which we need to stay in the air. The bad drag is from the body. There is a little bit of body lift in KSP, but the ratio that we experience in lift is much smaller. So what we want to do is we want to minimize the ratio of body drag to wing drag. This ratio is critical because due to the limited TWR available from ion engines, we need a certain ratio of lift to drag such that we'll be able to maintain level flight and accelerate. In my original ion plane, I achieved this ratio by having a ton of wing area, but this relegated the plane to fly at very low airspeeds. I'll note that this is the same approach as the real-life ion plane that was built and flown last year by MIT. I'm not implying that my video that came out a year earlier might have been somewhat responsible for that, but I'm happy with you guys assuming it on your own. Part clipping offers an alternative solution. By clipping the engine and fuel tanks into this test plane, I can ensure that almost all the drag on this plane is from the wings. As a result, I'm able to get a lift to drag ratio of around 5 to 1 at 200 meters per second, and just under 4 to 1 at 300 meters per second. 300 meters per second turned out to be the most difficult speed to progress through, so let's take a look at the TWR of the ion engine and see if this is going to work. In order for us to maintain level flight and still accelerate, we need our ratio of thrust to weight to be greater than our ratio of drag to lift. At sea level, ion engines give only 2% of their normal power, and we're definitely not going to be able to fly. However, if we increase this to 6.4 kilometers altitude, ion engines have 62% of their normal power. Fortunately, there are some mountains this high in Kerbin, so if we take off from this altitude, we should be able to fly. At this altitude, I'm going to have 1.24 kilonewtons of thrust for each ion engine. During the aero tests, I was able to maintain reliably a ratio of at least 3 to 1 lift to drag. This means I want to maintain a TWR of at least one third or more. This means that my craft will be able to have about 380 kilograms per ion engine. The ion engine itself is already 250 kilograms, so this doesn't give me much mass to work with. This slim difference in mass is going to need to contain the massive wings, fuel tanks, batteries to supply the ion engines, and it's just not enough to work with. However, if I'm already at 13 kilometers, I'll have 1.8 kilonewtons of thrust per ion engine. After using my ratios, this gives me an available mass of 552 kilograms per ion engine. After subtracting out the mass of the engine, this more than doubles the available mass I have to work with. To make things even better, getting to a 13 kilometer altitude is actually something we can do. As seen during the demonstration, at speeds lower than 300 meters per second, my ratio of lift to drag is actually a lot higher, which means that if I first climb to 13 kilometers before trying to make it through the 300 meters per second barrier, I can fly with these ratios. As I've just discussed, a little under half of my takeoff mass is going to have to be ion engine. Ion engines are very efficient, so this might make it sound like I'm going to have a lot of delta V to play with very easily. However, a lot of the mass is really already accounted for. 
Right off the top, 48% is the ion engines. After that, 16% is going to need to be wings in order for me to achieve the necessary lift to drag ratio. After that, about 31% is going to have to be batteries to have the electrical charge to supply the ion engines. After everything is subtracted out, only about 3.5% of the takeoff mass is going to be actual ion fuel. This means that each stage is only going to have about 720 meters per second of delta V in a vacuum to work with. For the first stage, the atmosphere is going to drop this to under 500 meters per second. Additionally, we're going to be doing work against drag and work against gravity, which is going to drop this even lower. As a result, we're going to need a lot of stages to get to orbit. Before I talk about the staging, let me reiterate that you'll see here that all of the stages are heavily clipped to allow me to achieve the necessary ratio of lift to drag. The three small stages in the center will handle the upper ascent, and the three large stages on the front will handle the lower ascent. In order to ensure that each stage is giving me a good amount of delta V, there's a geometric progression in the mass of each stage, with each one being about twice as massive as the one before. This geometric progression of stages led to the next crisis, which is part count. The takeoff mass of this plane actually isn't so bad, and it's just about exactly one kiloton. This is a lot, but I've also done a lot more, and I've done planes that are orders of magnitude more massive than this. However, batteries and ion engines are both very small, and as a result, I've needed a lot of them. And when I tell you what a lot is, I recommend you sit down, because it came out to just over 2,000 ion engines and just over 16,000 batteries. How is my computer going to handle this? It's not. There's no amount of turning down graphic settings that's going to solve this part count problem. In order to get this to run, I'm going to simplify the physics simulation through part welding. Part welding means that instead of calculating the forces on every single battery, it's going to treat clusters of batteries as a single part. Similarly with the ion engines, instead of count calculating the thrust vector for all 2,000 ion engines, it's going to calculate a smaller number of thrust vectors that sum to the same amount of overall thrust. I've done a lot of work to ensure that the overall forces on my craft are going to be the same, and that the only meaningful effect of this part welding is to make sure that my computer and my game is able to actually run this. While I've been yapping, I've taken the liberty of starting to fly this over to our top secret mountaintop runway. The mountaintop runway turns out to be even bumpier than the old KSC runway, but Despite quite a bit of wobbling, everything does manage to stay together. In any case, we won't need the Goliath engines anyway, because we're ready for our ion-only ascent to orbit. Since delta-v is at a premium here, I'm going to use a little bit of my elevation to get some free velocity before firing up the ion engines and blasting off the ramp. After takeoff, fearless pilot Bill Kerman's going to lose a little bit of altitude until we get to around 100 meters per second and can maintain level flight. Accelerating through this speed is fairly easy, and with the first stage I'm able to get to a speed of 242 meters per second at an altitude of 9 kilometers. Detaching these first three stages requires quite a bit of caution. In order to balance the mass and lift of each of these stages, they all include some wing area on both the front and the rear of the craft. In order to prevent collisions during staging, I toggle off the engines and have the stages set up to gently nose down and out of the way. The second stage here has pushed through the hardest part of the ascent and has got us up to 320 meters per second at just under 15 kilometers. During the next stage of ascent, I really focus on picking up speed rather than ascending and reach a speed of 590 meters per second at 17 kilometers. At this point I ran out of luck with detaching stages and impacted the stage I had just detached with my wing. This caused me to start swinging back and forth in the yaw axis. This craft was extremely unstable along the yaw axis and once it had started oscillating it was really difficult to stop. By the time I had it stable I had really started to lose a lot of altitude. 
I had planned on losing some altitude during this stage, but not nearly this much. However, I had been doing good with the ascent so far, and I was still well within my margins. By the time I finished this stage, I was at a speed of 1,033 meters per second, an altitude of 15.5 kilometers, and was climbing quite well. This was actually better than I was planning to be doing at this point, so maybe I accidentally stumbled into a better ascent profile. Detaching stages is quite safe at this point, and the flying went smooth, and by the end of stage 5, I was at a speed of 1,610 meters per second at 18.5 kilometers. During the sixth stage, our centripetal acceleration is getting great enough that it's really reducing the effects of gravity, and it's able to push us all the way to suborbital trajectory. As I get close to a full orbit, two possibilities face us. Either I've tremendously over-budgeted this mission, or I have destinations planned past low carbon orbit. Now that we've reached LKO, let's take stock of the fuel situation. I have 356 kilograms of ion fuel remaining, and I can reveal that some of both of the earlier possibilities are true. I did always intend to try to get to Duna orbit after reaching LKO, but I'm also doing way better than my budget had planned for. I had planned on detaching the last wing stage after reaching a suborbital trajectory, but since I had fuel left, I've chosen to put that towards the transfer to Duna. Part of the way through the ejection burn to Duna, Bill finishes exhausting the fuel in the sixth stage and performs some much-needed weight reduction. In terms of Delta V, Eve and Duna are roughly tied in terms of separation from Kerbin, so there's not much to be gained with the gravity assist here. You could use one off the moon, but as mentioned, we're doing really well in our fuel budget, so I'm just going to do a standard home and transfer. Once we've reached our rendezvous with Duna, we could very easily aero capture into an orbit because orbital speeds on Duna are fairly low and there's absolutely no concern about any parts burning off. Things have been going quite well so far. Too well, really, so Bill decided that despite only having 122 kilograms of fuel remaining, he was going to attempt the landing. While planning the landing approach on Duna, I realized that I had forgotten to include a parachute. This is not a manufactured attempt to build drama. I had sincerely planned and tested this using a parachute and somehow forgot to include it on the actual mission I recorded. However, since Bill Kerman's safety is an absolute last priority around here, we're going to try to go ahead with the landing anyway. Bill's new plan is to try to use body lift to maintain level flight while letting drag slow us down. At first, this body lift was working so well that the paranoid part of me is a little bit concerned that my subconscious somehow managed to plan this without my knowledge. I was gliding so well that I was really at risk of overshooting the mountain I was trying to land on. At 500 meters per second, I opened up the service bay to increase my drag and slow down a bit faster. Not only did I start slowing down a lot faster with the doors open, I really wasn't gliding as well, and by the time I was at 300 meters per second, I was no longer able to maintain level flight. At this point, we turned around and started a retro burn with the ion engines. Body lift is now working against us and actually generating negative lift. As a result, I had to angle this quite a bit closer to vertical than I would have had to in a vacuum. Drag overall, though, is still helping us, and as we get close to the landing spot, we have plenty of electric charge and fuel remaining. After planting flags and footprints, it was time to assess the probability of making it home safe. Unlike in many other landings, the problem isn't too little fuel, but too much fuel. The electric charge we have limits how much fuel we can actually use during the ascent, so having too much will actually increase our mass and prevent us from getting to orbit. Luckily, Bill has plenty of ways to use the excess fuel, including flying over to the nearby summit.
The small stage at the bottom, containing a tank of gas, was actually just here for the interplanetary transfer to Duna. But because we did manage to land with it, and we have extra gas, there's no reason not to use it, as it does have a thousand charge in it. The utility base stage above that also only has 1,000 electric charge. This was because I determined that the stages above that, which I built first, only needed a little boost to get to orbit using one tank of gas. The main reason I used a utility bay was to contain things like the parachute, which, after I forgot to include, really made a mockery of the staging here, but somehow it all still seems to be working out. The third stage here is the first significant stage, containing 3,800 electrical charge that's able to get us all the way to 557 meters per second. The body lift from the fairing that helped us so much with the descent also helps us a lot with the ascent, and due to the low gravity on Duna, this really felt like a winged ascent profile. The second to last stage in this whole mission contains 2,000 electric charge and gets us all the way to a suborbital trajectory. We're then going to leave the fairing on and wait until we coast to space. Once we're in space, we crack open the fairing and reveal the latest variation of Bill's classic ion space chairs. As seen in many of my previous videos, these tiny ion chairs have a surprising amount of delta V, and with the help of an Ike assist, this will be able to get Bill all the way back to Kerbin from low Duna orbit. While this shares most of its parts with the ion chairs I've used in the past, I've redesigned this one for this mission, and I want to talk about what I've done here. One of the challenges with using these if you want to recover the pilot safely on Kerbin is that if you mount the pilot in the normal control orientation, he burns up during re-entry. One solution to this is if you mount the pilot prone, he's safe. The problem is, is that he's not facing the right way for you to be able to perform maneuvers in space properly. You can get around this by attaching a docking port, and that does work, but it adds 20 kilograms. What I've done here is I've added a decoupler, which separates the part with the chair, the reaction wheel, and the fuel tank from the engine. This makes it light enough that this craft on re-entry is going to slow down fast enough that Bill won't burn up during re-entry. In my previous mission where I used an ion chair, I needed the docking port on the chair anyway, so it didn't cost me anything, but for this mission I didn't need it and I was able to save 10 kilograms with this approach. As I get near the KSC, I am again reminded of the fact that I am running out of shenanigans to pull while paragliding into a landing at the KSC. I asked for suggestions in my previous video, and as far as I saw, I didn't see anyone suggest any. So I'll reiterate my request, come up with ridiculous things to do as I land at the KSC, and I'll try to pull them off. For this landing, I'm going to attempt a triple bridge paragliding fly-through. So in summary, we have yet again failed to kill Bill, but we have proved Stratz and Blitz wrong, and any day where you can do that is a good day. See you in the next one.